Okay, everybody, welcome to Wood Chat for July 25th, 2012. Uh, I'm Matt Gradwell from Uppercut Woodworks. You can find me on the web at uppercutwoodworks.com or on Twitter at Uppercut Wood. Uh, we're here with Chris Wong. Hello, and you can find me at Flair Woodworks on Twitter at Flair Woodworks. My blog is flairwoodworks.com. And our guest tonight is uh, the podfather himself of woodworking, Matt Vanderlist. Say hello, Matt. Hello, Matt and, and Chris. See, actually, I can say hello, Matt, this time because I'm talking to another Matt. So. <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. That might get confusing. <laughs> it and could where can people find you on the web and, and on the Twitter? On the Twitter. Well, first of all, if you want to find me, my website is mattsbasementworkshop.com. And if you want to find me over at the Twitter, you can find me at, at, at MBW Podcast. And occasionally you'll see me popping in there in the middle of the day, something saying something really funny or completely ridiculous or not funny at all, as my family prefers to think it is anything I say. Uh, but there's a good chance that if I'm tweeting, I'm probably in the bathroom doing something else still. So it's my only private time during the workday. I just thought I'd throw that out there. And we can also hear you chortle on the yes. online radio. So. Um, yeah. For those of you who are watching the video, if you want to participate and offer questions up or comments up uh, to WoodChat or a guest, you can do that um, at uppercupwoodworks.com slash woodchat slash chatroom. That lets you watch the live video broadcast and participate. Oh, sorry, I have to mute myself. That lets you uh, watch the live broadcast and also participate in the Twitter chat um, at the same time. Um, so, uh, really quick, Chris, you have some announcements for us? Right. Uh, next week, we have Shannon Rogers joining us for Wood Chat. Oh, I uh, want to apologize to everybody right now for that. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well... I don't know if Google so Plus is tall enough for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good one. <laughs> and uh, that'll be at the same time, the regular time, which is Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Pacific or 9 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be great. We're going to try and get this. That'll round up everybody having everybody from the uh, Wood Talk online radio crew as yeah, guests yes. on Wood Chat. Um, and with nice. that, hey, congratulations on episode 100, Mr. Vanderlist. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, no, we, we've done really good with episode 100, but now we just did 101, and apparently we've reverted back to our good old days where it's just it's humiliating and horrible to listen to. But, uh, you know, it, it still is, it's, the, it's the new century, basically, I guess. So now we've got a whole another 99 to go before we have to, you know, really be on our best game. And how many? How, how long did it take you guys to do 100 episodes? Is that Let's see. Um, we started in 2007, April 1st, 2007. April Fool's right? Day, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, or was it? Yeah. Yeah. It's 2007 because it was one year after Mark and I both started podcasting our own shows. So that means we've been doing it for five years. Wow, five years! Holy cats! I've had relationships that were shorter than that. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> so, but yeah, it, it's definitely, and, it, and it's so funny because neither one of us realized that we started it on April 1st until the anniversary show came around, you know, one year later, and then it was like, should we even admit that we started on April 1st? I mean, there's a lot that you could read into that if you think about it, especially people listen to those first probably 10 shows that we did in the first year. Is this an April Fool's joke that's been going on for five years, basically? Pretty much, yes. Yeah, and, it's, and it hasn't gotten any better, hasn't gotten any funnier. In fact, I think the funny thing about it is the fact that it continues, definitely. <laughs> and uh, you still get calls from Roberto. Yeah, although it has been a few episodes since we've heard from Roberto. Apparently, uh, in the process of moving, he may have lost our number. I'm not sure. Uh, or the fact that he, I think he's much closer to the Mark Adams school now, so it's very possible that Mark Adams is getting all the, you know, the, the calls. How, how could he lose the number when you read it every episode? Well, apparently I must read it in a unique way every single time, so it must throw everybody off. Because I know what Wilbur Pan was asking, when is the opportunity going to come around that I will actually repeat it the same exact way as sometime previous in the, you know, the first 100 episodes. <laughs> gotcha. Um, Wood Chat, ha or sorry, Wood Talk Online Radio is changing its format a little bit to be more of a call-in show, right? 
Yeah, we were experimenting with that. Um, if uh, Well, again, when people listen to uh, 101 where we started getting remedial once again, Mark accidentally called in with his personal Skype uh, account, so we didn't have the Wood Talk Online um, account. So we, <laughs> we kept telling people to call in on the, on the Wood Talk Online and the phone number that we gave out, and it just didn't work this time. But... If we pay attention next time, we'll actually maybe have the right account and we'll be able to take care of that. You know, people calling in is such a unique uh, um, way to do it because there, there's no way to really schedule it in. There's no way to have like a break like we're going to talk about this, this, and this, and then take callers because our biggest fear is, and rightly so, you know, we, somebody could call in and basically think that nothing's connecting, so they might just hang up, and there's our missed opportunity. So it's definitely going to be uh, interesting as it goes along, but I really hope that we have more callers that, that actually call in. So everybody that's listening to this, please call in at the next one in the next... We're supposed to do it in two weeks, but maybe it'll go out like three weeks or something. Okay, and do you still take voicemails for We'll Talk on the Radio? We will take voicemails, snail mail, email, however you want, you want to get you know your, your messages to us, your... your your questions, we will be more than happy to, to read them. Can't guarantee if you email or, or anything else like that that we'll read it correctly, but we will definitely try to get the information out. Cool. Uh, and so you've been with Woodblock Wood Talk Online Radio since it started. Yes, yep. How has the show, in your, how, in the, in your eyes, how has the show changed over the last five years? Um, I want to say that we've gotten a little bit more professional, but one thing I will say is that, and Mark and I have talked about this, even when we do the, the DVD review show, which is really way behind on getting a, an episode out lately. We have you know two that we're getting ready to work on. Mark and I have this weird, even though we're, we're not necessarily looking at each other uh, via video or anything like that, there's this unique way that we can just pick up on each other's cues. And now with Shannon coming on, we're finally, there's just like this weird way of just like, it's almost like you hear like a certain breath or something and you know that it's, uh, it's safe to jump in there. Now, if people listen to the show, occasionally it does sound like we're talking over each other and, and that does happen, but it, it's funny how over the past five years, I think it has gotten to that point where we really are able to, to read each other's minds to some degree and know when enough is enough when you're, you're talking about something and, and when you need to maybe stretch it out a little bit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um, in, the, in the early days at this year, there's like we we joked around on the, on episode 100 about we all excited when well we got a a, a cable line for uh, the Vanderlis household, but for the longest time, if you listen to some of the earlier Wood Talk online, you'll notice there'll be a, a long gap in there where Mark will do quite a bit of the talking, and oftentimes what ended up happening is I had to completely shut down my end, and he had to carry the show until I could get my Skype back up and running, and that so was just one of those do things. Over, over, you do the whole thing over Skype, and Mark records it. Yep. Yeah, that's the way it's been since day one. So, yeah, we tried to do a, a, it's something that I had, I had jokingly heard referred to, and I saw this on another podcast. They call it a double ender, where we would both record our ends and <laughs> try to splice them together. But that was just it, it didn't always work out. So uh, that's when we we've been doing it on Skype, and Mark's pretty much been the uh, the recorder uh, all the time. <laughs> cool. Um, and then when did Shannon come on board? Let's see. Shannon came on board. I want to say it was late 2009, but I don't, I don't think that think that's that. right. I think it was 2010. Um, and maybe it was 2009. I know it was uh, uh, it was t towards the beginning of the year, and we had always talked about bringing like a third voice in, just to kind of really get like a third perspective, and just it, it just seemed like it would the show would kind of was going in that direction. Like we really needed to have somebody else kind of fill in and just, you know, bring something to it. And uh, we at one point had, um, oh my gosh, uh, uh, Rick Waters came on at one point and we, uh, he was a guest host. And we never really announced that we were looking for a third host. It was just kind of like something between Mark and I, like, you know, let's just give this a shot. I mean, what have we got to, you know, got to lose? I mean, if anything, it was also a nice break in case one of us ended up pulling up sick because there are a lot of times that we would have to cancel a show because one of us either just didn't feel good or something came up where if we have the, the three co-hosts, you know, potentially, and it has had, has happened, uh, two can take over rather easily and just do it without the third. So it's nice to have that option. Well, I know that um, I really enjoy the show, so I hope you guys have, you know, nine, at least 99 more episodes. Well, thank um, you. I do a a road trip during the summers every weekend, two and a half hours each way, and that's when I get caught up on my um, 
get caught up on my Wood Talk online. So um, when I go that's through a frequent Washington, comment we get. There's no radio signal. That's what I listen to. So. And, and that's a frequent comment that we get from a lot of people. It's like, you know, hey, I just went on vacation to, you know, this amazing vacation spot, and you came with me. And I'm like, whoa, wow, I don't even remember that one. We must have had a hell of a time. <laughs> so um, what's on your bench right now, bud? Well, actually, uh, I am finishing up a couple of the uh, photography boxes that I, I do for my wife for her, for her weddings. Um, one Both thing I have... The little ones that she puts the pictures in? Yep, exactly. In fact, it was funny because I was experimenting around with some solid wood that I had uh, it, that was up on the, the shelf, and I, I ended up uh, resawing some because I really wanted to I want to have an opportunity to work more with solid wood for it just to see what we can do. So I just finished up two of those, and the other thing I'm doing right now is I want to start making some more uh, accessories for my tools. So one thing that is actually literally on my bench right now is I'm getting ready to make a uh, table saw sled. Uh, using some of the micro jig uh, zero play bars, so um, definitely looking forward to that. And uh, also play with a lot of magnets lately for uh, storing some of my tools. It's uh, it, it's it, I don't know, it, it's a weird thing. I feel like I'm a kid again, just like you know, trying to get stuff stick, and then I just stare as it is hanging there. <laughs> <laughs> the magic of magnets. Exactly. So that was a recent episode uh, for you, which is uh, kind of reaccessorizing your shop. Yes. Uh, yeah. Are you finding a lot of stuff that you acquired over the years that you just like get rid of it? You know, it's funny you say that because this this summer we had a um, neighborhood has a huge garage sale and my shop really literally got emptied. I I, I got rid of a ton of stuff and it, people were just coming out of the woodworks. You know, as soon as they hear there's a garage sale with woodworking equipment, people mm. just show up like rabid animals and are fighting over it. And I would say I cleared out probably a huge chunk, one whole end of my shop, and it was stuff that, you know, I maybe used once, um, I maybe was convincing myself I'm going to use again, and stuff like that, and I finally just said, you know, I just can't do this anymore, I've got to get rid of this stuff, because it's just taking up valuable space, and who am I, I'm kidding myself, I'm, I, you know, and, and if people see it in the background, they're going to maybe get false hope that I might actually use it, so... Yeah, it was it was sad to see it go, but there were some pretty happy faces uh, when they were buying it. Nice. So what did what'd you get rid of? Oh, let's see. Um, I got rid of my really crappy router table that I had. Um, I got rid of a uh, actually a, a router combo kit that I had that um, I was pretty much never ever using. Um, I got rid of some. Uh, you know, Miles Craft makes like a, a, a pro sign kit and uh, inlay, not an inlay kit, but like a design pattern kit where you use yeah. uh, your router and stuff. I, I, I never really used that, and so I ended up getting rid of that and uh, some hand planes that actually, if I... What? Yeah, there were oh. a few in there. They were, they were some ones that were... <laughs> I know it's blasphemy, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> but the smiles on their faces of the individuals who bought yeah. them were yeah. well worth it, so, yeah. you know, kudos to them, but uh, let's see, there was a couple other big things that went. Episodes, in a lot of your video episodes, there'd be the shelf in the back behind you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Piled with planes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when, when I do plan on panning back over there, there will definitely, the piles will be much shorter, um, mm -hmm. there'll be more cinder block behind me, but surprisingly, it, it actually looks like nothing went, to be quite honest with you. My wife really? walked down and is like, I thought you sold some. I'm like, I did. Did you use that money to pick up anything new? Um, no, we ended up actually throwing or that money. Are we not allowed to talk about it because you haven't told your wife yet? Uh, <laughs> no, she, she unfortunately Correct. she's home when all the packages show up, so she knows exactly when things that I've purchased. <laughs> so, and of course, and then when I purchase them and they get stolen off my front porch, you know, that's that's always fun too. <laughs> oh, great, great. Yeah, so Where's, that's what exciting. What's on your bench? What is on my bench? Um, or, or yeah, what is that back there? It's on your bench because it's so big, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm working on a loft bed right now. Um, is that going to go up over the bench itself so you can just jump right out of bed, get right to work? <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Um, it's not actually for me, though. It's um, designed for a child. Let me show you a picture here. Oh, well, It's got a sweet. staircase on one side. It's got a slide on the other side. So climb up to bed at night, then when you get up, just down the slide and you're off to work or whatever. Oh, I need that. It makes it easy to get out of bed and hard to get back into bed. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. 
What's going to be under those stairs? Is it going to be open or are there going to be drawers? There will be drawers opening up uh, towards the slide. Very cool. Into very, very yeah. cool. Is that your design or customer's design? or? Uh, it's and? based on something that the customer saw, but it's my design. So very I'll cool. be... I'll be drawing out some plans for a magazine later, magazine article later on. Very cool. Very nice. Now at the top of that, it looks like it, it's something that could hold like a canopy or something. Is that the That's idea, right. like almost like a tent? Yep. There'll be a cloth draped over top of that. Um, and oh. that's not up to me, though. All right. Well, I'm going to make sure my slide I can not see this. Uh, soy, um, how do I, <laughs> soy Matt Gradwell. What are you going to use for the uh, for the material on the slide? Is that just going to be like lacquered or? Plastic? I haven't I haven't figured that out yet. Um, one suggestion was to go with melamine. I may go plastic laminate as well because I can actually do the whole curve in one piece. Right. Yeah. Very cool. But still working on the details. The bed itself is uh, dug fur, and this is this guy got some beautiful old growth quarter sawn, rift sawn old beams that I've been sawing up. Beautiful straight grain. Oh, wow. Hard and, oh, well, as hard as fur gets and heavy. Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. Rob, Boas, Rob Boas wants you to make him one, a king size one. If you do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't, it's actually, it's actually I, I love the idea of a slide. It makes, it makes a lot of sense, I think. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, definitely. Here's the wood that I was starting with here. Yeah. So I had one stack here. This is a uh, 12 quarter, three inch, and then uh, eight quarter, two inch stuff. So I've got that all over my shop and my backyard right now. <laughs> oh wow! Now you you had some blog posts up about that, didn't you? Working with that? Yeah, yeah. I've been doing my tweet along for that for this project. Okay. Uh, documenting every step along the way there. Very nice. Yeah, flarewoodworks.com slash blog, and you can find every step along the way there. Cool. And that's all reclaimed lumber, or...? Yes, it's actually out of um, a railway bridge from the Okanagan, B.C. No way. That's very cool, very cool. Well, I haven't done much woodworking since um, Memorial Day, honestly. I've been busy at work, but I've got a buddy who is... Uh, we're kind of woodworking together... He's doing a um, electric guitar, and so we've just been doing router template work, um, just a couple nights a week. So, and it's been going really well with my new Bosch router, which I am <laughs> totally in love with. So, um, it's got the vacuum attachment that works very, very well. So, I'm pretty psyched. Pretty psyched. Oh, nice. But this fall, when um, summer starts to calm down, I've got like four projects on the backlog that um, mudroom lockers, a uh, apothecary chest. Okay. Oh, okay. Doors, um, a pirate-themed entertainment center. Um, where they want <laughs> what is that going to look Wine barrels and make them look like rum barrels or powder kegs and make cool. them look like they've been hit by cannonballs and burn the edges <laughs> oh, um, and separate them. And then uh -huh. put planks in between them to put uh, TVs wow. and uh, audio video gear on them. So that should be a very unique challenge. So, Where are Definitely. you going to find the wine barrels from? Uh, well, you know, here in Washington, we actually make a lot of wine. Okay. And, um, Explains a few things. Yeah, yeah. And we also make Starbucks <laughs> coffee and very good beer. So every Explains night we get drunk things. and... Um, uh, every every morning we get, uh, we get our coffee to get going, but... Um, there's quite a few, and we also have a lot of distilleries here now, making their own vodka or whiskey. Uh, so you can find them. You can talk to these guys and get get barrels. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice. Cool. So um, one of the things we wanted to we talked with Mark about, you know, a lot of people know Mark's story about how Mark got into woodworking, miserable at his day job, um, was lucky enough to be able to work with David Marks. Um, worked at his buddy's refinishing job, yep. had uh, Nicole, you know, really kind of pushing him towards uh, quitting his job and helping him start his own business. But I don't know how you got started in woodworking. So can you tell that story? 
Well, it, it, it's it's pretty simple. It's uh, uh, Boy suddenly discovered one day that um, he he liked working with wood, so he kind of just played around with it. You know, growing up, of course, there's the, the typical story where my grandfather was the one who did all the woodworking, and when I would hang out with them for the summer, because I would go out to their place for a couple of weeks each summer, and uh, I, I would hang out with him all the time, and I'd never get to play with any of the tools. I just get to watch. So when I got old enough, then it became a matter of really wanted to start doing stuff when I bought my first house. And that's really how the whole thing started. It was, and I think a lot of us are the same exact way. You know, you start doing a little remodeling, you start, you know, playing around with this. Suddenly you start watching PBS and there's this guy named Norm, you know, all these things. And that's really how the whole thing started. And then after that, we had like a friend that was like, oh, you're a woodworker. Can you make, you know, some tables? I'll pay you. All I heard was the I'll pay you part. And I said, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. And so that's how the, the bug really grabbed a hold and have just never, never turned back. You know, I, I, I did really play around with the idea of I, I would love to go completely professional and drop the day job, you know, or the current day job, I should say, and pick up a new day job as, as woodworking and stuff. But um, it definitely not going to happen at the moment. Um, I, I guess I'm just a little too greedy and I like the regular paycheck or something. Uh, so the family likes it too. And yeah. so, you know, that that's that's where I am right now. But, of course, also, I, I do have to admit that before woodworking, I was a hardcore mountain biker. It's hard to tell with the body I have now. Really? Yes. And I, I, at one point, I wanted to start my own messenger service, but it turns out that actually here uh, in the Muskegon area, not a high demand for bike messengers. No? No, I probably <laughs> would have to sleep uh, somewhere with my bike curled up on the ground if I were to uh, attempt that business. So I, that's why I stayed in my field currently. Is there a project you can... Uh point back to when you were doing your DIY stuff in your home that you call your maybe your first woodworking project um let's see the, the first um yeah actually I guess the, the first closest that really kind of covers the, the the two uh DIY and everything was when I rebuilt like a, a whole bunch of shelves for, or excuse me, drawers for some built-ins that we had in our old house. And that was the first time that I really had a chance to like take apart some, some drawers and look at the construction of it and just think, are you, are you serious? There has to be a better way for these things to go together. Um, and so then that's when I really started looking at, you know, like what, how would Norm build this? What, what would Norm do if he was faced with building these drawers? And so that's the first real time I had a chance to build something, you know, an actual box that, that went together with some decent construction. And from there, that's when I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a dresser. What the heck? So I built a, a small dresser, and that was uh, not the prettiest thing. In fact, I keep trying to hide it, but my son likes to use it for his video games. He puts everything on top of it. So it's out in plain sight, and I just try to convince people we bought it at Ikea. So. Is that the pro project known as Aiden's Dresser? Dresser? No, no, no. That's that's a much later one that I'm actually proud of. It's uh, okay. it's near Aiden's dresser. I have like you know, hello, ugly son, meet nice son. So <laughs> illegitimate son, meet you know regular son. <laughs> so between the two dressers, how is how is your uh, technique uh, evolved? What's what are kind of some of the main differences in the in the projects? Oh, the first one has to be the fact that I completely understand uh, making a square cut. Um, I hate to admit it, but for the longest time when I had my, my first table saw, uh, the concept of like squaring up the blade was completely lost on me. So I could never figure out why my joinery would never come together. Like people talk about a simple butt joint. It's the easiest joint in the world. You just take two pieces and slap it together. And I'm like, I can't slap it together unless I have you know, like 2,500 pounds of pressure with these clamps to pull everything together. Um, you know, so that, that's the first one. I, I think what it comes down to is just understanding joinery just a lot more than I did initially. What works, why it has to be a specific way, and, uh, and stuff like that. And it's amazing with just a, you know an understanding of just a few joints. It's amazing what you can put together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about finishing? What 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 were the two finishes on the two? Uh, well, actually, they're both. Uh, well, actually, the first dresser is still unfinished because I keep trying to drag it out and burn it. And I don't want any toxic fumes going into the air. Uh, but pretty much my go-to, 
uh, finish has always still just been just straight up polyurethane. I mean, it it's it was invented for a reason. It works pretty good. It's not the prettiest thing necessarily, um, but I, I like it because I'm familiar with it. My idea of a, an exotic finish is shellac. So <laughs> that's you know that that's kind of where I am still in my my woodworking progression. So shellac is kind of your go-to finish. It is now, um, but still, actually, I, I, polyurethane is really the vast majority of my stuff. Like when I when I build stuff for people, they yeah. they're still like you know they want poly or something. They they don't trust the shellac, and I'm like, all right, no problem, you alcoholics. And are you are you brushing or are you doing a wiping varnish or spraying? Uh, brushing. In fact, actually, just recently, I. I um, became the owner of an Erlex system, and it is still in the box, but I have Ooh. read the manual at least twice. <laughs> Which one do you have? The uh, 5500. Yeah. yeah. So, so I yeah. have the Erlex 6900, and I'm telling okay. you, um, fi I told Mark this, finishing was the thing I hated the m second most. The, f the thing I hated the most was uh, sanding. Uh, you right. know what? You, I'm right there with you. That but is now, with the spraying... Uh, I don't mind the sanding so much because I've kind of got a system. I've kind of just learned to get in the in the zone and and, and love it. But I'm telling okay. you, spraying man is that is the, that's the hotness. We you know the first time I ever tried spraying. Have you ever seen those little critter uh, sprayers? The ones that you know yeah. you you put the mason jar. Yeah, that was my first experience. Oh, the and critter. I, yeah, the little yeah. critter. Yeah, I told you guys not to slam the critter. I loved my critter when I had it. <laughs> I, you, I found mine, actually. I probably should have sold it at the garage sale. No, they would have thought it was a little pen thing or something. You're really good at creating a cloud of finish in your shop. Exactly, yes. <laughs> yeah. You so. fill your entire shop with a cloud of finish, and you push your project through it, <laughs> and it gets coated. Yeah. That, that, that sounds like I used to apply my cologne when I would go out when I was single. <laughs> It's just, you know, Your just, car? Car? Yeah, just vaporize, you know, throw it all up in the air or something, just spray it all over and just walk, you know, back and forth through it. Cool. <laughs> hey, uh, I think Chris has some questions from the chat room. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, from Robert Egbert. Um, Matt, what is your favorite joint? Um, I would have to say that my favorite one currently is, I like the blind rabbit. I do a lot of my drawers with, like, uh, like a blind rabbit. I just like the idea uh, that, you know, okay. You know, it's kind of, it, it's it, it's such a basic joint, but it's kind of got, like, that neat little, you know, like, aha, it kind of comes together. You got a little extra gluing surface there. I actually like doing my drawers that way a lot better than uh, with, with dovetails. Um, I think dovetails are really neat. I have fun doing them because they're just so creative. Like, you, you yeah. really have to work at it. You feel like you're a woodworker when you do <laughs> dovetails, you know. But... Um, when it comes down to it, I mean, I, I think I, I have quite a few drawers or dressers or, or and just drawers in general that I've built for projects that I, I've used that on there. And it's just, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's kind of a fun one for some reason. I don't know I get a kick out of it. It's weird. <laughs> Is that on your table saw or on your router? I usually do it on my table saw depending on um, how, how big the actual drawer is going to be. I've had a couple of really, really tall, like deep drawers. And, you know, I, that's what I've thought, oh, it'd be so much easier if I just hook up the router and brought the tool to the wood versus the wood to the tool. <laughs> so, yeah, that's definitely, I, I think that's the one. Do you ever reinforce it with dowels or anything else? You know, that actually, I have been doing that one a lot recently, too. Um, Hedrick Vario, uh, the old guest expert at Matt's Basement Workshop, uh, he did an article in Fine Woodworking uh, where he had talked about that, and he you know, we, we talked a little about it, a little bit about it, and I said, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. And I've had a couple of projects recently, one one or two that were featured on the show, where that's how I finished off the drawers on them, and I, I like that too, especially if you get a contrasting wood or something with those yeah. with the dowels. It just it really it's it's really kind of neat looking. It, it takes it to another level. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and it just yeah, and but of course when you point it out to people, you know, who really don't appreciate woodworking, they're like, Yeah, so you're saying the drawer is open? Cool, that sounds awesome. <laughs> Why didn't yeah. you use those big metal slides to make it roll on a ball bearing? I I've gotten that one several times, you know. That you're just like you just want to slap your head or just like, let's just get this piece of furniture out of the house, please. <laughs> do you do you guys dislike metal slides? Is that what I'm hearing or I think they have their place. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, not I agree. Not necessarily on reproduction furniture. Definitely not. No. Yeah. Although you got me thinking now. 
<laughs> we, it, you, you, on, on children's furniture, I love it because it's so easy to open and close. Because uh, Aiden's dresser is actually everything's you know traditional joinery there, and the kid will never close his drawers. I mean, it's he's had that for several years now, and the ongoing fight all the time is you know when are you going to close these things? Because when I walk in in the middle of the night, I end up bashing myself, and there's going to be blood all over these dovetails on the edges here. So. I think it would have been far better off if I put the metal slides on there because then he'd have no excuse. Well, he would have an excuse, but less of one. All right. So, Chris, what kind of thinking do we have you doing about metal drawer slides? On period furniture? <laughs> <laughs> no. Not on period furniture, but in general. No, I, I was actually thinking of doing something like that. On period furniture? Yeah, although I wouldn't be the one to build the period furniture, so it'll probably never happen. Um, I just like to take ideas that seem out in left field and make them. If, if, I, like if I was going to use metal drawer slides um, on something that wasn't utilitarian, yeah, I'd probably use the ones that mount underneath so you don't see them. Yeah, the blind ones, yeah. Um, when I, bu I built a dresser where the client wanted the handles not in the center of the drawer, so I used the metal drawer slides because mm -hmm. pulling, pulling from a corner the drawer wasn't going to open if you, yes. you if you didn't use metal yeah. drawer slides. So um, yeah. I used heavy duty ball bearing, blah blah blah, full extension ones, and it worked fine. So yeah, you know, I'm thinking if you yeah. do use metal ones, like say like on a, on a like some sort of like reproduction-y looking kind of thing, you could totally steampunk it. You know, just get crazy with me if you. Oh, that's you a know. good idea. Yeah, just like totally dress those yeah. things out or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was talking to a. I was talking to a friend about, um, he's building a desk and it's got, I think it's got one drawer across and it's probably about a four foot wide drawer. And we were discussing ways of making that drawer slide and we, we decided that the best way to, to make it not bind was to use metal drawer slides. I can see that. Yeah, because once you reach that certain point, there's a tipping point where it can be yeah. too big and too, too cumbersome for traditional. You know? have and, to be very precise in how you pull it out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because there's, there's a piece that I built for my wife and I, and this is one of those, again, you ever build those pieces where you know that if you ever sold the house, that piece has to go with the house because you yes. just don't want to deal mm -hmm. with getting it in and out? And, yeah. and that's what we have this dresser that I, um, I, I want to say that I measured for the nearly exact clearance to get it in the door, but um, that's a <laughs> lie. And so I, we were able to get it in place, and the drawers are just at that edge of the tipping point where if it was any longer, even by half an inch, I don't think that they would be anywhere as easy to open as it is right now. In fact, sometimes they do kind of bind a little bit. So, yeah, it, it, yeah. And that's one of those weird design things that you don't think about until, um, until it happens and then it's too late. <laughs> this is one piece I want to show you guys here. This is um, a piece by Gary Bennett, or Gary Knox Bennett. And it's called the nail cabinet. So he's got this cabinet here. Looks like uh, maybe walnut with a curved glass door. Beautiful joinery in the drawers. Yeah, I know this piece. But the twist. Uh, where is that here? Yeah, right, right there in that top here. door. Right here. He's taken a nail and drove the nail right in, bent it over. This is, it looks like a maybe a ten penny nail. Yeah. So he took this beautiful fine piece of furniture and just some people said destroyed it, some people said it made it it completed it. So I don't know. What do you think? It's just a it's interesting is what I think. Is that a pull is he using is it a pull or just uh, decorative? Just decorative, I believe. He's got a pull farther up, the U shaped thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was almost like his homage to the, the big, you know, F you people, don't tell me what to do. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I've, I've had that sensation at times because I, I really, there's an ongoing argument that I always lose, and I, and I know I set myself up for failure on, on it, whatever the argument comes up, but I feel like I've never actually built something specifically for me that I've designed specifically for me, you know, kind of a thing, and I've had those moments where there is that like that one that one just inkling you just want to do something just to like make it yours even if it's a mistake or a mess up or something just so that you can kind of put your own little fingerprint on it um yeah. you know and so but yeah i i i get where his his feeling came from <laughs> yeah okay let's move to the next question um this one is from mark cherry woodshaver okay. 101 and he asks do you prefer hand joinery or machine joinery yes 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I really, once I, I discovered the beauty of hand tools, I, I tried to go full immersion. I tried to go full hand tool like crazy. And, um, but as it goes on, I really find that my hand tools are my, my finishing tools. They're the ones that I use to refine. In fact, uh, I, sometimes I wonder why I have like a, a number five uh, jack plane anymore because to be quite honest, I don't use it as frequently because it's not something that I use to refine my pieces. So for me, um, I do enjoy still doing a lot of joinery by hand. Occasionally I will deliberately do stuff where I have to break out my hand planes to do it. But what I, I like mixing the machine and the hand because I feel like you know the one really gets me to where I can take it from uh, uh, you know working hard on a project to having fun with a project. The yeah. machines are my work hard. The hand tools are my have fun. So dovetails. Yeah. You ever done dovetails with a machine? Uh, you know I did, and unfortunately, um, it's the same reason why uh, um, some people may not like a certain hair color on a girl. They just had a really bad experience uh, on a date with a person like that. Um, I myself had a really bad experience with my first uh, dovetail jig, and it, it's jaded me. Um, I know that there are some really amazing ones out there, and I just, because of that one experience, I cannot get past not ever wanting to do dovetails with a router or any other machinery. You have post-traumatic dovetail jig <laughs> disorder? I do. It, it's very hard to get over. I have woken up in a cold sweat screaming, no, 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 no. So, <laughs> so if you're going to do dovetails, how do you do them? I, will, I, I do them by hand. I, 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 yeah, I, I feel very confident. In what I'm doing. They don't always turn out pretty, but if there, there are some that are going to be definitely showing, um, those are the ones that will take me like a half an hour to do like one you know, kind of a thing, but they will be the, the prettiest thing you've ever seen. Um, and that's where I took a class with Jeff Miller in Chicago, and he did a lot of stuff about kind of like little things that he talked about, like repairing and how to hide things and stuff yeah. like that. And so yeah. the, the one thing I paid the closest attention to was how to hide you know, mistakes and dovetails. So mm -hmm. I've gotten really good at hiding my work or my mistakes. That, that's an important skill to know how to, how to fix your mistakes, how to hide them. Yeah, it, it, you, sometimes you only need one little trick, one or two little tricks in your arsenal, and it covers yep. a wide assortment of mistakes. Yep. So, yeah, definitely. Is there another question from yeah. the chat room, Chris? Yeah, I like this one that just came in from uh, Kenny, Wood, the Wood Ninja. Uh, does Matt have some huge new go-to? Is that something on the mic? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's got yeah. Captain Lou Albano. He's just hiding it behind a microphone yeah. afro. Yeah, I had to take out my uh, my my uh, rubber band because it kept getting stuck in the microphone. So <laughs> uh, there was a question early on from Brian, and he's asking um, if you ever got your saws from USPS. No, unfortunately. I don't know what that's about. Yeah, um, I, I ended up. I had some uh, um, older hand saws that I had, and, and I should clear this up. A lot of people think that like actual like table saw blades or or something like that were were stolen from my front porch, but unfortunately I had some uh, hand saws that I was uh, cleaning up and I sent them off to uh, Bob uh, Rosieski at Logan Cabinet Shop to sharpen for me. And I was all excited because he, he sent them off and he, he got them done. We had this whole thing about, you know, like one was going to be for softwoods, the other was going to be for hardwoods. Uh -huh. uh, and I was tracking them with uh, the delivery and confirmation stuff on my, on my iPhone and they were shown that they were dropped off at my house, and when I got home at night, I asked the family, like, hey, did, was there a box for me? And they said, no, we got the regular mail, but there was no box. And it turned out that uh, the box was stolen off my front porch. So there's a part of me that really hopes that Bob did an amazing job with those saws, and those people are bleeding someplace in the ditch, you know, but... Um, they should call hospitals and ask them for... Uh People who've been recently admitted with fingertip lacerations. <laughs> we don't. I was actually over in the emergency room for a meeting today. I should have double checked more. I think about it. But yes, sadly, uh, those saws are are gone. So um, it's Jeez, time to start sucks. looking for some new hand saws. Yeah. It, it, what really makes it sad is the fact I never had a chance to actually use them. So I'm sad, but at the same time, I'm not like you know overly upset because. Well, I never really had a chance to use them, so, eh, what are you going to... Yeah, it bites. <laughs> hmm. 
So you've had a customer that's had you um, build multiple things for them. Uh, I, yeah, I've had one or two that yeah um, they, they keep coming back and I don't know why. What do you? <laughs> <laughs> I love your self-defecating humor. <laughs> Um, they do too when I grab the check and run out the door. Yeah. And I assume, no checks, I assume their checks never bounce. Yeah, and yeah, but when they ask for a refund, I'm like, I'm sorry, he doesn't live here anymore. So, um, so one of the topics that people want to talk about a lot on Wood Chat is uh, running a woodworking business. Okay. And Ooh. finding the right customers, the right repeat customers. Right. When you think about these re two repeat customers you have, mm -hmm. what do you think the keys are to the um, relationship you have with them and the work that you do for them and um, that that's keeps them coming back besides your awesome work buddy besides the well that was that's the main one but no what it really comes down to is I, I have to admit that the these two uh, couples um, they really appreciate the, the quality of, of a piece and and the fact that you know there is somebody behind who behind it who's standing behind it and is gonna say you know like I did this deliberately because I don't want it to fail you know, I, I you know I, I want this to uh, serve the purpose that you guys intend it to be. Um, there there's some that have been very specific. You know, that, that they'll look at stuff like at some of the big box stores, the big furniture stores, or stuff, and it looks fine, but they're just have they don't have the confidence that it's actually gonna you know stand up the, to the test of time. And so that's the nice thing there. What I guess I'm really trying to get to is is they to some degree they're an educated consumer, and that's the hardest part from what I've been seeing. In fact, my wife and I had a conversation about it tonight about, you know, like, well, could you build some more pieces maybe, you know, and because and, I, I would love to maybe even just go part-time, you know, dip my toes in the water kind of a thing. And I said the hardest part right now is there really is not the educated consumers out there, and maybe that's, again, we've talked about it so many times, you know, how, how do you educate people to what is fine furniture or nicer furniture, finer furniture than you can get, you know, at whatever retail store or something. And that seems to be the key. Were they educated about this stuff before they engaged with you or did you facilitate that through conversations with them? Both, actually. One couple, uh, they definitely were, and a lot of it had to do with uh, uh, one spouse. Um, her uh, uncle was a furniture maker uh, back in Romania. And so it was like one of those, if you're going to have something made, you want somebody who has some skill to do it. And that was one of the things that they talked quite a bit about, you know, when we were doing it, when we were coming up with the piece. The other one uh, was a, a, a family friend who we go to dinner with them quite often and, you know, go out for drinks and stuff. And that was like one of those, well, why should we ever have somebody build something for us? And I'm like, really? All right. Let's do this. This sounds good. And, you know, so for once my salesmanship actually worked in my favor and not only have they, they purchased pieces, but their next door neighbors have purchased pieces or oh, per cool. purchased so pieces. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and then on top of some other their coworkers ha have had uh, asked for pieces to be built. So, you know, it, and it's definitely I'll explain to them whenever they come. I'm like, look, my price is going to be way more than what you'd pay, you know, at the retail stores. So. If that doesn't scare you off, let's go ahead and talk. <laughs> Very cool. Very yeah. Cool. But definitely um, educating the, the the consumer. So what do you do when you get approached by a consumer that, um, I always call it the pottery barn. <laughs> uh, hey, I saw something in pottery barn. I'd, I'd like the similar thing made at di with different dimensions. Um, can you know? Can you make it for me? And I, I usually say yes, of course I can. But I give them kind of the warning that you give your customers. How do you, how do you handle that when you get these I, random inquiries like this? Um, probably, probably I, I bet probably the same exact way you do. I, I do kind of say, well, yeah, I, I can build that. My favorite is when they're like, I, w I want this to be um, like a cherry wood, and I said, well, how about this? Why don't we build it out of cherry? You know, uh, <laughs> that that's probably our first step. You know, and then oh, and and then we'll kind of go from there. There's always that initial shock. You know, at first when you say, well, I realize this piece is going to cost. If you purchased it from the catalog, it's like you know, five hundred dollars, and I'm definitely not going to. Uh, I'm not going to come close to that. Oh, that's excellent. That's what we're hoping for. Like, no, 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 no. It's mine's going to probably be more than that. <laughs> you know. 
And then um, there have been plenty who have just kind of like, at that point, the, the conversation's over. It's just pleasantries then. Yeah. Um, but there are those that at least will listen to the whole thing and will explain, you know, let's do this, this, and this, and you know, we'll, we'll change this because I think this will be much more stable. I don't know how they build it, but this is how I'm going to build it. And you know, a, a very small percentage will follow through after that. Um, but yeah, it, that that one's really hard because they look at those and they assume like, you know, oh. I think that they, they think that those catalog stores have craftsmen like locked away and they're like little elves or something and they just like the do all Swiss this stuff elves, by hand. Made by elves in the Swiss Alps by hand. Exactly. You know, and you're like, mm, no, not really. It's by, and probably by machine. Tears of unicorns. <laughs> white paint. Unicorn tears. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, it, it's like a cherry wood. Let's. It's probably. It's probably just like you know, dipped in cherry pop. Yeah. <laughs> I had to educate a consumer on. What cherry actually looked like? It's it's not that yeah. dark red, purpley crap. It's just wood, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do your customers it, follow along uh, with the build? Um, I've I've mentioned it. It's funny because a lot of people are like, "Oh, you like have a blog or something?" Um, yeah, actually, I do. So because oftentimes, um, especially if the last few pieces, when when I'm doing something on the show. Uh, I, I often will kind of give like I don't want to say like a small discount, um, but I, I will just kind of say like you know hey I'm gonna be doing this on the show and stuff, and it kind of helps me to have content and stuff like that. Uh, considering the last couple of builds have more or less been for for family and friends, um, you know I, I don't give them like the, the the full price, but even then I'll like talk about hey I just put up an episode and you can see how it's coming yeah. together, and they actually don't watch so. <laughs> Interesting. I had one customer that really enjoyed watching, and every time I told them I'm not going to be done on time, they were like, mm-hmm. that's okay, we saw you working hard, and you know, we know what you're doing, and so go ahead and be late, we don't care. Nice. <laughs> were, were you really working that fast, or was that time lapsed? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I think there's a couple more questions for us from the, from the chat room. All right, uh, question from Bill Griggs. If you could have only one woodworking tool, what would it be? Oh my gosh, that is gonna that's that's a hard one. I'm gonna have to say I am in love with my table saw at the moment. Um you know, I it's funny cuz there was like a whole point at one I think maybe last year, maybe the year before where I was trying to like I'm gonna get away from working on the table saw. I'm gonna go to the band saw. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna try and prove that you don't need a table saw in the middle of your shop to get, you know, uh, this, this and this done. And in fact it's actually brought me closer to my band saw. Or to my table saw, excuse me. Uh band saw I just cheat on on the side. Uh but the table saw is I, I do all sorts of stuff. I mean I've even got to the point I do all my mitering on my table saw versus even using like my, my miter saw or anything like that. I just I love the accuracy and everything I can get with with my current table saw. So that's that's the one that's that I'm gonna have to go with. I think that's a popular choice. I think so too. And the the way that they're built now and everything else, you can just do so much on them. It's mm-hmm. and they're so accurate. That's what's really scary. Yeah. Yeah. Especially compared to my old one. That old one, I mean Accuracy was never thought of when they designed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that slider on mine, oh, I love that thing to pieces. Oh. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on to another question. Um, from Dave Barden, uh, what style of furniture do you admire and who inspires you? You know, I don't really have a style that I necessarily follow, but I guess <laughs> the vast majority of my stuff looks awful shakerish, to be quite honest with you. And so I, I think I still am in like a shaker kind of style. It's funny because I, I really love the look of uh, arts and crafts, but I have yet to actually really honestly make something that can be called arts and crafts. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just I, I, look, I have books galore on arts and crafts. In fact, I ended up having to loan one to one of my neighbors because I was out talking with him and I said, man, you guys have got that really cool uh, Sears Craftsman home that you guys are living in. That is just really awesome. I'd love to get inside to see it. And he goes, it's a what? And I said, oh, I've got a book on it. I'll loan it to you. So yes. um, That seems to be you know, the, the one style that I, I want to build, but I, I, don't, I just haven't gotten there yet. And as for Inspire, <laughs> um, uh, I, my mom inspires me. <laughs> the children inspire you every day. There you go. 
Yeah. Um, so it looks like the chat room has decided that you're wrong. Okay. Uh, that the bandsaw. Is wrong. <laughs> well, said bandsaw. Uh, well, the chat room, yeah. um, they are known to swing one way or the other, usually the opposite direction of where I am. I think it's a natural universal balance. Um, it's mm -hmm. like being on a seesaw. If Matt's on one side, we all need to pile on the other just to get it somewhere in the middle. I'm pretty sure you and I could work a seesaw pretty good. <laughs> we definitely could give it a run if, for if that, money. If that center point could. I think be, uh, either one of us were on there, both ends would probably be touching the ground. <laughs> yeah, I'll stand, the, I'll, I'll stand in the middle. There you yeah. go. <laughs> well, you know, I, I will go along with the chat room, and I'm notorious for this kind of uh, fence sitting. I, I do, I do like my bandsaw, and now that I think with the new setup, I I just may use the bandsaw a little bit more. But um, I've always got one eye sitting on the uh, on the table saw, so mm -hmm. definitely. Right, for this project I've been building, I've actually been using the bandsaw a lot more because it's closer to the door. <laughs> I have tools like that. <laughs> table saws behind all the stacks of lumber. Yeah, I've, I've done that plenty of times where I'm like, I know it's going to take me 20 minutes to do it on this tool, even though it's the wrong one, but um, yeah. this one works for me right now. Yeah. This book here, if you're interested in arts and craft furniture, it's a great book, um, written by Kevin Rodell and Jonathan Binson. Um, it covers arts and craft furniture, the the movement from the start to the end, and it discusses motivations. And it's it's really interesting how it kind of flip flopped on itself. Um, it started as being a revolt to the modern the industrialization of furniture making, where everything was made in big shops. This is something that could be made by small independent shops, small craftsmen. And then, as it turned out, it's very machine oriented. So it ended up being produced. In, in mass quantities. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, it's a great book, a great read. Uh, check it out if you get a chance. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I definitely will. I'm going to add that to my list because, yeah, I like I said, I, you know, there's a magazine called American Bungalow, and that's like my crack yes. magazine. I just absolutely, yeah. I'll sit down in Barnes & Nobles with my big, tall caramel macchiato, and I will just start, like, flipping through that magazine, and then they scream at me because I spill all over because I get excited when I see something in there. So. <laughs> that sounds mm -hmm. so sweet. I know it's yeah. You it, it is. Snuggy at the Barnes and Noble. I am. I'm like, oh, <laughs> can somebody turn down the air conditioning? <laughs> uh, Chris, you want to take this last question here? Sure. Um, from Robert Egbert again, Sandhill Woodworking. Uh, I, I think there's a movement in this country to start buying higher quality and from local craftsmen. Do you find that as well? You know, I I really wish I could say more about that. Um, I, I think that to some degree there is. It seems like there's a, a, a huge movement for anything. Uh, almost it kind of reminds me a little bit of, of like the arts and crafts, like the artisan movement. You know, I mean, like we we all excited like because we have the cheese lady in Muskegon, who is right next door to the bread lady in Muskegon. Literally, that's the name of the stores. And it, they're they're small um, local shops that are making things that you can easily identify with people that you can actually have a conversation with versus yeah. just somebody who like me when I was a teenager was just like, I don't know, it's over there. Um, so I, I, I think along with that, there seems to be that the mindset that everybody is kind of thinking, I want to be a little bit more educated about the things that I'm purchasing. I want to understand it more, you know, <laughs> and it's not just vegetables that people are buying locally. It does seem a lot of people want to buy things that are in their backyard, literally. So yeah. um, I, I would love to see that. Now, if that tr translates into higher quality, that's even better. I'm sure there's a few shyster furniture makers in somebody's backyard who probably um, should have the shop burned to the ground <laughs> more than anything yeah. else. But um, I hope I'm not on that list, actually. But you're not inciting riot, is what you're saying. You don't want any vigi woodworker vigilantism. No, not unless they're really awesome tools, and on the way there, you could drop them off. Or when you're done, drop them off at my shop, in which case I will put the box out immediately <laughs> for people. You know, just wipe the blood off. That's all I ask. Um, okay, so we've only got five minutes left, so if you're in the chat room and you have some final questions, let us know. Otherwise, we're going to start to wrap up here. Um, Matt, while we're getting questions, what's uh, what's going on with your site? Um, anything new come in? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's the same old thing. I really do need to kind of maybe do a little upgrade here or there, but... Um, you know, the work has been moderately busy, and uh, my main my main focus is just to keep bringing out content. You know, the summer months are a killer on content. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is funny because I hear from a lot of people yeah. that will say, "Oh, the summer months is when I get out and do all my woodworking." And for me, summer months is when 
I almost do no woodworking. It's yeah. it's I, yeah. very hard to get myself into the shop, even when it's so friggin' hot out. That it's the only place you want to be, especially in the basement. But mm-hmm. you know, the the winter for me is is that that's my optimal shop time. Yeah. So. Um, I guess if anything's going to be coming soon, it's more content, definitely. Cool. So we're cool. having Shannon Rogers on next week. Anything you want us to specifically <laughs> ask him about? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm curious if he's actually going to be using technology now that he is going to be uh, the you know uh, the head uh, craftsman over at the Stepping Stone Museum. I figured he Who's was going to go full immersion. There? Was that? Yeah, yeah. Wow. He just got offered the position, so. Yeah, I figured he was going full immersion, um, very similar to uh, a young Roy Underhill, and I figured he would completely turn his back on technology. So don't be surprised if he, he doesn't show up on you guys. So, so he'll, he'll somehow be spinning electrons on a treadle lathe yes. and sending them out over a braided leather cord to the Google? Uh, very, very possibly, yes. <laughs> or he's going to, uh, although I think he said the Stepping Stone Museum is more like early 1900s, so it might all come in via telegraph. Is what I'm oh, thinking. There we go. Morse so code. Start, Morse code. Yes. That would be great. Yeah. So st- yeah, start boning up on your Morse code. Uh, Vic Hubbard wants to know what color do you use for your mani pedis? <laughs> uh, I am more of a clear currently, but a you know I do have my blacks at, at certain moments where I just want to let people know that I'm very, um, I'm very into my emotions at the moment. <laughs> well, that oh. ends when the hot flashes end. <laughs> exactly. Are you in Which will be somewhere right? around October. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I think that we will wrap up. Um, Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, uh, thank you. I just want to say thanks again. You've brought a lot of people into the craft. Um, you've inspired a lot of people to start blogs and uh, and woodworking. So, uh, you know, you. every time I get a new spoken wood or a wood talk online radio or Matt's basement work, uh, workshop podcast. Uh, you know, I stay up, it bugs my wife, I lay in bed next to her with the earphones in and the phone right here, and uh, she says, turn off that light, it sounds like you're trying to get the aliens to land. <laughs> the I, I, incessant you know, chortling it. is killing me. Yeah, is. <laughs> I, I love it, and, uh, you know, I think it's, um, it's, it's great to see um, just a regular guy woodworking and going through the standard stuff that any of us are going to go through instead of... You know, somebody asked earlier, or you were talking earlier about what would Norm do to fix those drawers. Right. Well, he would just put a log in his drawer-making machine. <laughs> oh, okay. exactly. And he would dial in the dimensions, <laughs> and the drawer-making machine would just go, eh, 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 and that would come a drawer. Yeah. And he'd wear his safety glasses and read his manuals, right? So, yep. so rather than the new Yankee workshop, it would be the new Yankee CNC machine. Yes, so. Yeah, and Bill Griggs, is in, <laughs> he loves CNCs, and, and, and that's great, but... Um, you know, I don't have a CNC, and a lot of people don't have Norm's shop, or even David Marks' shop. Or uh, so it's great to just see, you know, a basement, a basement workshop, and true basement woodworkers. So well, thank you, I, I really appreciate that. I, I definitely do, and it's uh, I never meant to do any of this. Like I've always joked around, uh, I've always joked around since the beginning. My idea of starting the show was I wanted somebody to come along and go, God, this sucks. I'm going to do a better one, and then I would stop doing mine and I would enjoy theirs, and then uh, apparently my competitive side kicked in. So. I, I hope you don't stop because I love the fact that there's such a, a broad range of content. We're going to have um, Steve Ramsey on from Mere Mortals Wordworking. Oh, sweet. And, and he is one of my favorite online woodworkers, man. The, that guy... That guy is Get Woodworking Week 52 weeks a year. I love it. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to have to turn in for that one. Sweet. Cool. All, All right. right. Well, that is it. Chris, you want to... Got any last thoughts, brother man? I guess that's a no, Mr. Wong? <laughs> what is, oh, okay. No um, final shot, no sorry. final thoughts from yeah. you? Um, I'm just going to head over to the MWA podcast and check out the end of that. Oh, that's right. Uh, MWA National right now is doing a yeah. uh, podcast live with Ron Hawk. I think that goes on for another half an hour, so everybody in Wood Chat should uh, jump over yeah. there and check that out. So Sweet. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for Wood Chat uh, on air here for July 25th. Next week at 6 p.m. Pacific, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. That'll round up the Wood Talk Online Radio Game. Sweet. Woohoo. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Appreciate everybody for joining in. Thanks for having me on. See you, folks.